Greetings and welcome to Outlaw Gamer Radio, the official podcast of OutlawGamers.com. This is the show where we live to play and play to live. I'm Brent Adams, joined by a man who is also priced similarly to a new game platform, but he is much more fun to wear on your face, Mr. Lord Baumgarten, Lauren! <laughs> that is a true story. That is, that is true words have never been spoken. Never. Never. Uh, how you doing, man? Uh, I'm good, buddy. How are you? I'm pretty, I'm pretty good. Nice to be back, everyone. And we're going to go ahead and get things. Actually, no, uh, at the top of the show here, uh, we, you know, we always try to, we like, are not going to get things going. We are not going to get things going. You know how we always try to like lead with, you know, corrections or apologies, uh, you know, to Yafit Koto as the as the case may be. Brent, you have nothing to apologize for. I have a I have a three a.m. half drunken live stream to apologize for. Uh, oh, so, sometime oh, over the weekend, oh. I was I was up late like three a.m. and like I tweet like, "Hey, anybody up late? I'm going to do some Metal Gear Solid Five uh, live streaming." And so I stream for about an hour, and I tell you what, like it, it's one of those things where I thought that I was. I thought I was pretty cogent and I thought that I was making, you know, some interesting points or whatever as I'm playing the game. And I go back and watch the stream later. And I was just like, Oh, Oh God, what was I saying? What was I doing? Uh, so it, it <laughs> turns out, awesome. it turns out exhaustion, a little bit of alcohol and Metal Gear Solid five, not the best combination with me. That is awesome. First of all, so I anyway. want to know, I want to know how, when you and I spoke yesterday on the phone for, However long we talk, 30, 40 minutes. How did this not come up in the conversation? <laughs> Basically shame. Basically just, just pure shame. But anyway, uh, this, is, this, this is the first time I'm hearing of this, people. For, for, secondly, those, for, those of you who, for those of you who suffered through that, I do apologize. Secondly, you know, it occurred to me the other day, I was playing some Rocket League, and I, I forget that the PS4 has uh, the capability of just broadcasting straight from the PS4. Yeah. Uh, and I, and uh, it occurred to me that, you know, maybe I, maybe I should do that every once in a while. Well, I, I do enjoy doing it and I'm, I'm going to do it some more, but uh, I'm just not going to, I'm just not going to wait that late in the day. And, uh, and by late, try. you mean that many beers in. Yeah. I'm not, I'm going to try to do that again. I, I, there was one, <laughs> there was one particularly embarrassing moment where some of, you know, we were talking about like the whole thing with like Konami dropping AAA and, I was trying to make like some kind of analogy about how like well I guess Konami's attitude is that you know like if either you can go AAA and like you have to go like really big or you don't do it at all like there's no half assing it and I was trying to like make that tie into like this whole like formula 1 analogy about how the cars have to go really fast in order to get the downforce and the heat and the tires and everything in order for them to work because if you only go like a little bit fast you crash and kill yourself like that kind of thing it's like I, I went back and listened to it, and I was just kind of like, "Oh God, why, why?" Anyway, <laughs> so uh, once again, uh, we we just want to apologize to Yafit Koto for that. Um, let's head into the garage and kick things off with something that will make up for all of my inadequacies, and that is Uncharted: The Nathan Drake Collection. We have a demo from it's uh, it, it's the Warzone section of Uncharted Two. Uh huh. And that's going to be coming on September 29th, which, if you know, you can do math, is about a week from now. I say about; it's a week from now. Anyway, the point is that uh, we also have 11 minutes of Uncharted One from the Nathan Drake Collection running on the PlayStation 4, and they've got that up on YouTube for you to check out. It's that section, uh, a little over halfway through Uncharted One, where Drake's been captured. And escapes, and there's a really, really exciting car chase. Uh, Elena's driving the Jeep, Jake's man in the gun in the back, and bad guys must be destroyed in the course of that gameplay. It's it's very, very cool. It's one of my favorite sections from Uncharted 1. And I don't know, Lauren, what else is there to say other than it looks... I mean, it looks damn good for, you know, like an HD remaster. I mean, it doesn't look like a modern game. It, it doesn't look like you know, Metal Gear Solid Five, but it looks damn, damn good. It does. Although I have to say, Brent, I am a, I'm a little bit concerned about, uh, uh, not overly, but just a little bit concerned about. Uh, you know, we've talked before about, and you are uh, very good at articulating exactly why this occurs. But you know how when you get a, you jump up to a 120 or 240 hertz TV, suddenly it looks like you're watching a 
a Betamax soap opera tape or whatever because yeah. it's so crisp and clear. Uh, yeah. I'm a little concerned about that happening uh, with the HD remake, honestly, but we'll see. Well, um, I will that's... say, having having watched it, uh, I, I'm curious if... It, so I, I, love, I love that part. I am super excited to replay all three games. Yes. But uh, I, I will say, after watching that, it's, it's really interesting to look at that, that uh, scene that you're describing, the Jeep chase scene, compared to uh, the footage that we saw of the chase scene in Uncharted 4. Yeah, the, 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 the bars moved a little bit in the I, I years. Significantly. I mean, I was watching that going, and I remember that scene, and remember how awesome that scene was, and how great it felt when you kind of get to the end, and you skid to the stop, and... and uh, and I look at that now, and I go, God, really? Is it? I mean, it looks, compared to what, I, it just astounded me, the leaps forward that, uh, that exist with the, in the Uncharted 4 chasing gameplay. So, um, we're looking forward to this. <laughs> when, when's the collection come out again? I, I can't remember. October 9th. October 9th, thank you. Yeah. October 9th it comes out. Yes, I'm very excited about it. Three games to play before uh, March 16th, I believe, when Uncharted 4 comes out. And... Uh, of course, by buying the Nathan Drake collection, you get yourself into the Uncharted 4 multiplayer beta. All right, there you go. Something else coming to PlayStation 4 next year is a really a really interesting title, a really interesting follow-up to a game that we've talked about on the show and that we, we both really enjoyed and were really impressed with. This war of mine, The Little Ones is coming to PS4 on January 29th, 2016, from 11-Bit Studios. This is the follow-up to This War of Mine, and it expands on the the essential principle, or the essential narrative of that game, which is civilians in a war zone trying to survive war. The twist in in this game, though, is an idea that they say they had from the very beginning, but they really weren't sure, they weren't, they, they were kind of scared about how it was going to be received and thought it might have been going too far. But because the reception to this War of Mine was so good and so positive, they said, okay, people are ready for it, and that's what this War of Mine, The Little Ones, is. And as you may have surmised from the title, this game explores what, the hardships of you know surviving uh, a wartime environment from the perspective of a child. And it's going to put you in charge of a group of adults and children who are stuck in the middle of this demilitarized zone. And you have to not only account for yourself, you have to not only account for the people around you who in the previous game were all adults like you, but now you've got kids to take care of. And how does that change your choices? How does that how does that, that change your outlook? What kinds of things do you have to do with them? I mean, obviously they see what's going on around them. The kids are still kids. They need to be. They need to be entertained. They need to be cared for, nurtured, reassured. So it's just going to add another really interesting level of emotional complexity to what is already a pretty deep game and and a very poignant game as well. Uh, the announcement trailer is is very interesting to watch. Check that out for sure, Lauren. What's uh What's your take on this? Yeah, because uh, this war of mine wasn't depressing enough. <laughs> We thought we'd really just try and get in there and add. And I think what I heard, Brent, was that the DLC is going to be uh, the life as a dying dog. Right. The pet of a child. The caught son a of zone. a wounded man caught in a war zone. Uh, I, so I think this is... We didn't I have enough people sticking guns in their mouths over the first game. So we're, <laughs> That's back, right. we're back again. Uh, uh, I think this is great, Brent. I th- this War of Mine was one of my favorite games of 2014. It is so brilliantly well done both emotionally and from a gameplay standpoint you ain't wrong uh, and i think i think that uh uh it's fantastic that it's coming to the ps4 uh, i assume that at some point it will wind up on the vita uh, which i think would be a great platform for it undoubtedly uh, um and uh, I, I think this is fantastic it's going to expose a, bro- a, a much broader audience uh to this ip in this studio who i think just did an amazing amazing job with this war of mine I agree. Uh, we wish uh, we wish them all the best over at Eleven Bit, and hope that uh, hope this one is, is is really more of the same. And I mean that in the best possible way because uh, the first game is phenomenal. Check it out if you haven't already. Uh, well, you know, it's just occurred to me. Although I don't think we planned it this way, but it's like a really PlayStation heavy oh, yeah. version of the Garage this week. Like all of this stuff's like PlayStation specific. Um, 
which uh, which we, we certainly didn't try to do, but it just kind of worked out. So sorry, it, I got a little Xbox when we're traveling into the sunset. Anyway, so uh, to go ahead and just go into the Return of the Jedi of it all, uh, the PlayStation VR, otherwise or previously known as Project Morpheus, has been announced. So it's going to be PlayStation VR, and really went out on a limb with the title this time. This this is the, not the same team that named the Vita, is all I'm saying. Okay, but uh, anyway, they've they've announced that it's going to be called the PlayStation VR. And nothing else. We don't have a release date. <laughs> we don't have a price. Uh, we ish. We do ish. 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 Well, we know that it's coming in the first half of 2016. Yes. And we know, according to Sony Computer Entertainment CEO Andrew House, that it's going to be priced similarly to a new game platform. And the last time I checked, a game platform from Sony costs about four hundred dollars. So. That might be a ballpark figure on what you can expect to pay for the newly minted PlayStation VR. Uh, 400 bucks is a lot for me and for a lot of people, I imagine. I mean, it is the cost of a new console. And, you know, the question, the question instantly sort of becomes on my mind. Number one, would spending $400 on PlayStation VR give me as much fun as, say, spending that money on an Xbox One? or a competing product like the Oculus Rift or the HTC Vive. So that's a that's a good question. It is a good question and I guess the the answer for me is all down to software. What what games am I going to be able to play? What experiences will I be able to have on PlayStation VR that might coerce me into into going there? And while while we've talked previously about how Sony is probably best set up as far as a whole ecosystem, they haven't really shown that off up to this point, and, and certainly it seems like in terms of software, Oculus is, is I think, had a stronger showing up to this point. So it's going to be interesting to see what things Sony is using to try to try to entice people into this. Lauren, I know that uh, you're as excited about VR as I am. How excited are you about PlayStation VR? Well, it's interesting, Brent, because you, you, know, you said that the, it might come down to software for you, and I actually feel like it goes in a different direction. Okay. I, feel, I feel like hardware is going to be a keystone here uh, because I think that, so I, I, have, I, I don't know this, and this is based on nothing uh, specifically I've read, but, but okay. uh, I know Palmer Lucky is really shooting for a $300 price point um, with the Oculus Rift. Whether or not they're able to get it in there, I have no idea, and it might be $300 for the... Uh, you know, it's coming with the Xbox One controller. Uh, the the, Oc- the Oculus Touch controllers aren't going to come out for a few months after that. Certainly, they will be sold separately. Right. So that'll be probably another fifty bucks or something. Uh, I don't know. Uh, you know, I don't know with the motion sensors that they're using how that's going to play out financially. Uh, the difference being, though, that with Project Morpheus or PlayStation VR, uh, they are locked into the specs that they have currently, which were launched in. Um, you know, 2013. what was 2013, right? So um, <clears throat> the, the Oculus Rift is, isn't tied down to that. Um, I don't know off the top of my head the specs of the displays and so forth with uh, uh, with Sony's PlayStation VR. Um, but even if we just assumed they're comparable, which I, I cannot assume, um, I know that the specs that uh, they are touting as the minimum requirement, which is essentially to say um, uh, for a good performance on the Oculus Rift, you're going to want a single 970. Um, and you're going to want something along the lines of a 4550 processor. Um, I know that the PlayStation can't compete with that, and I have to wonder at $400 how they will be able to compete technologically, say, two years from now or three years from now. Right. Well, it, where obviously I could upgrade my video card or go ahead. Yeah, I, I think I think it comes back to you know something we talked about way back when, which is the fundamental difference between console VR and PC VR is consoles and PCs and the, the two sort of different philosophies of those platforms. And, and you're right in, in that if you already have a relatively well spec gaming PC, then it only costs you $300 to get the Oculus Rift, in theory, to get Correct. the Oculus Rift and to get into VR. But if you don't have a, if you don't have the specs already on your PC, then you're going to be paying I mean, what would it, like? Okay, me as an example, I've got the specs of this thing across the board except for processor. And to upgrade my processor means I've also got to upgrade my motherboard. So for me to get probably another three bills. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Yeah. So 
I'm talking about 300 for the for the uh, for the Oculus. I'm talking 300 for processor and motherboard. So I'm 600 on that as opposed to another you know another maybe 400 on let's just assume worst case scenario another 400 on the Morpheus and the 400 I've already spent on my PlayStation. So. You know, it, that's the thing. It's just, it just comes down to that whole thing. Do you want like a turnkey solution? Well, certainly it depends, Brent, on what you have. I mean, to to, to make that comparison, if you're going to make that comparison, I think it's it's only fair to say that, um, you know, just like you said, you're assuming a well spec PC. You're also assuming PlayStation ownership. So if you tried to get into the Morpheus, for example, and you don't own the PlayStation, you're facing eight eight hundred dollars. That's right. As a, to get in, do you know? So and and, and to and what, what what do you think? I mean, didn't they say it would cost basically a thousand bucks to build like the minimum spec Oculus PC? If you were building it from scratch, that, that probably. So if you don't have there. anything, if you don't have anything, and you want to get VR, PlayStation VR is going to be cheaper. Right. If you had nothing, it would PlayStation VR would be cheaper, absolutely. And I, but I think so. So certainly, and, and you make a good point, Brett. That certainly it's going to depend on what you already have, right? Yeah. So uh, I already have both. Some people will already have only a PlayStation, but not a high spec PC. Some people have a high spec PC, that sort of thing, right? Um, but I think I do think overall. So so if you look at the two devices, say three four years from now, you will be able to your entry level price point for the Oculus Rift will have gone down significantly. Uh, whereas your PlayStation is going to stay the same, and the quality ostensibly can't get any better until there's a new PlayStation, right? So it's I mean it's an interesting. Yeah, it just well, depends. I think it depends on when you're buying within a certain and, margin of uh, again. Although on the other side of that, you could argue that in the PlayStation world, you're developing on a closed ecosystem, so you can optimize better. Uh, that, well, that's right. I mean, like right? you know, the games will look better as the as the console goes on. Until they reach that, you know, that kind of like theoretical that threshold maximum, sure. where it's like we really can't do yep. much more with it. But they, you know, so they will improve a bit over where where they are right now. But you're right. I, I mean, it, it. But again, like to me, like those are the fundamental differences between PC and console. Is you buy a console, you're locked into whatever that hardware could do for its lifespan, and you can't move beyond that. With PC, you can always evolve it and upgrade. But it, you know, it, it costs money to do that, and so. I, I I really think that this is ultimately going to come down to just if you're a PC gamer, chances are the Oculus is going to be the way you go. If you're more of a console gamer, chances are PlayStation VR is the way that you go. Since I and many others have you know either option, it does become a little bit more of an interesting question, and it, that brings me back to software for me. So wait, so let me ask you another question, Brent, yeah, if I may. Yeah, go ahead. And this is one of the things that my, it's interesting. This is really interesting to actually talk through. And certainly, this we're up in the garage, and now I'm thinking, oh, this would be an interesting clubhouse topic. Right. But uh, 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 so I'm curious. I'm curious. You know, one of the thing when you talk about software is uh, there is a fundamental difference between PC and PlayStation in the nature of the types of software you will get. And the, and sure. I jokingly was thinking. Yeah, but you know, <laughs> I was jokingly thinking like you can't get VR porn on the PlayStation. No, I, I mean that's right? absolutely true. I mean that's absolutely a valid point, and and you're right. You're only going to get Sony sanctioned software, right? And so on for the some people, the VR or VR porn, and, and all joking aside, might actually matter. But also things like um, you know um, things that are like, for example, travel stuff. I know Google. Uh, people have played around with Google Maps to make uh, you know VR I- uh, integrated Google Maps. So when you're looking something up, you can it's actually like you're standing there. Yep. The Street View becomes essentially a VR experience. Uh, that's something that likely won't be available on the PlayStation. I mean, non gaming sort applications of VR, educational applications, um, three VR desktops, VR web browsing. Um, you know, these are things that might only, in the, at least in the beginning be available via a PC experience versus, say, a PlayStation. I wonder if that's meaningful to people or not. I, I, I certainly think it is. I, I mean, like, when I, when I talk about, the, like, the deciding factor for me is content. The deciding factor for me is what can I do with my theoretical VR device and, you know, which, which one of these two devices that I would have access to, theoretically, Oculus or, or well, I'm, or a PC-based VR or PlayStation VR, it it really would just come down to what can I do on one that I can't do on the other, and which one of those experiences is more valuable. Yeah, and I'll tell you just from my own experience using the the Oculus Rift, I think one of the most immediately um, viable and immediately compelling experiences that people are going to 
have and want on virtual reality is going to be watching a movie in a virtual movie theater. I, I think that there's going to be a, a I think there's going to be a larger selection of things you can do on the PC side at the beginning than on the console side. I, I, at, right now, that seems almost a certainty. And of course, Brent, there is to add on to that what will be the virtual reality uh, Outlaw Gamer Radio show where you get to sit in the studio as Brent and I record. Yeah. Staring at a 50 foot rendition of Brent's beard. That is going to be so awesome. And we should really get started figuring out how to do that right now. Let me just go Google how to make virtual reality porn. I mean, beard, beard. Damn it. Damn it. <laughs> And we're back. All right, friends, time to step into the clubhouse. And as usual, we have a poll from the website to go over before we get into this week's topic. So why don't you run it down for us, Brent? All right, so last week we were talking about the uh, the Mad Max review score, Hullabaloo. And our poll question accordingly is, where are you at with the Mad Max review score, Hullabaloo? <laughs> where are you at? In last place, fourth, with 11% of the vote, you said, doesn't really matter how you feel about the score, they aren't going anywhere or about the scores. They aren't going anywhere. In other words, review scores aren't, uh, aren't being usurped anytime soon. Third place answer, 28% was review scores are fine. People only get upset about them when they disagree. Narrowly edging that out for second place with 29% was the answer. This is more about how a specific game is clicking with different people. But the number one answer, 32% was... It's just the latest example of why review scores aren't the best approach, which is certainly certainly where uh, where, where I I land on this uh, on this scale. And thank you everybody for voting in that poll and uh, and contributing your comments and 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 uh, thoughts on the subject. Lauren, yes, sir. What do we got lined up uh, for the topic this week? So uh, <laughs> this week, go figure. We're going to be talking a little bit about Metal Gear Solid Five. I'm sure, uh, but this isn't so much about the game, although it is uh, as the about the concept introduced in the once and former contributor to PC Gamer Tom Francis's rec- Fran- Francis eyes Francis's recent article. Francis eyes is a good uh, name. He should go with that. Uh, <laughs> Tom Tom Francis's recent article uh, on PC Gamer. Tom has uh, since left PC Gamer and is now actually working as a game developer. But he decided to. Uh, muse on Metal Gear Solid Five when he was playing, and he wrote an article for them entitled "Metal Gear Solid Five: The Phantom Pains." Quote failure spectrum. And Brent, you uh, brought this one to my attention. You thought this was an interesting concept, and I have to say that after reading it, I agree with you. And it's basically about the concept, essentially, of uh, failure in video games, yeah. and what does that look like, uh, and, and what should it look like. And Tom talks a little bit about what he calls a failure spectrum, uh, which is the um, sort of move away from uh, what was very traditional in video games many, many years ago, which is just essentially death. And then you start over, you go to a checkpoint. Game also over, still restart. Game continue. over state. Yeah. Very common uh, in modern games as well. But he talks about how in uh, Metal Gear Solid Five, it's more of a failure spectrum. It's not such a black and white thing. And how that creates these really interesting, intense moments uh, as you're trying to avoid the failure. And it's not just a simple, oh, I'm dead. But there's a, a, a series of sort of um, checkpoints almost in the, in the failure process that you can, at which you can sort of stop the uh, slide down the mountain, if you will. And so, uh, if I may, Brent, I'm going to read what Tom has written about the process in Metal Gear Solid. Please. Just to set the stage. So he writes, Metal Gear Solid Five has most of the stealth genre's most generous fail-safes, plus an incredibly generous one of its own inserted at the crucial moment, reflex mode. The result is something like this. If a guard sees you, you get an awareness indicator showing you where they are. If you reduce your visibility, that goes away completely and the guard won't even investigate. If you stay in sight and or make yourself more visible, the guard will very, very slowly come over to investigate. Even then, this alerts no one else and doesn't count against you in any score or performance metrics. And you don't even have to move. Going prone and using a hide button makes you damn near invisible. Then if they do definitively see you and recognize you as an intruder... Reflex mode puts the world in slow-mo and you get a huge amount of time to do something about it. Your view is snapped to the person who saw you. The yelp of recognition they make seems to be inaudible to other guards. And if you shoot them in the head with a quiet weapon, of which you start with two, in this ample time, no alert is triggered. 
If you fail to take them out in this time or someone else sees them die, the surviving guard will yell. Others in your shot will be alerted, but no one beyond that stage. Your default weapon is rapid fire, accurate, and silenced. If you can take out everyone who heard before they have a chance to radio, the alert is contained. Then, even if you do give them time to radio, it will do nothing if you've already taken out their, equi- their communications equipment. Even if they manage to radio reinforcements, it's easy to run away and they won't give chase. <laughs> it just keeps going. Even if you don't run away, it's quite possible to kill everyone without taking a hit. Even if you take a hit, your health regenerates for free. Even if you get hit a lot, even if you get hit by a mortar, you only go into a wounded state that restricts your movement, but still gives you a chance to take everyone out. Finally, he says, if you fuck that up, yeah, you're dead. He's he's absolutely he's absolutely correct. That's a very <laughs> accurate description of sort of the hierarchy that you go through uh, in, in Metal Gear <laughs> so, Solid so, Five, and I can so, personally have testify. you ever died playing this game? I, I've died tons of times. I've died tons of times, <laughs> and I can tell you it was fucking effort to make it happen each time. Because see, despite the fact that you have like all these various degrees of of things that you can do to to get seen and then hide or whatever. I will settle for nothing less than perfect in my missions. And so if anybody, if anybody even like spots me, if I even get like the sense, the enemy sense thing <laughs> that says that they, they might have seen me, I go running into the middle of the compound, let them to execute get killed. me and restart the fucking mission because I'm <laughs> fucked up in the head, Lauren. Yes, I'm not right. Are. I could see that. I could actually see that happening, dude. And, and, um, <laughs> it's difficult it's difficult to get killed like like the thing that i do is i just run and stand in front of one of the like one of the anti like the heavy machine guns they've got like mounted on a tripod <laughs> right, or if right, i right, see right. a guard who happens to have a shotgun i'll run to him because he'll take me out faster but I'm, i mean like seriously like i've had to sit there for a minute plus just getting shot at and I, i've like seen the hit counter go up like you know 20 hits taken I've gotten shot twenty times before fucking Snake has died. So, so let me ask you: Isn't this a? a, 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 a this isn't necessarily meant to be a discussion about Metal Gear, but isn't this a pretty significant change for Metal Gear? I feel like when I played on un, un, uh, Metal Gear Solid Four, it, 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 when if you got caught, you were almost fucked. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely it's definitely evolved. Uh, you know, from like you know from where it was. I mean, like every time I play, like my wife still, and this just goes to show you how much you played. I played of Metal Gear Solid, but my wife will be, you know, sitting there just like on the couch crocheting or or, or cross stitching. Pardon me, and uh, she'll be sewing. Is the fucking point I'm making here? She'll be sewing, and I'll be playing the game, <laughs> and I'll, I'll I'll do this whole thing where I'm like, oh, you know, fuck it, I'm just gonna go and you know, like kill myself, and she'll start going snicko, snicko, which is, I mean, she heard a thousand fucking times when back when we were playing. The, the Japanese import version of Metal Gear Solid on the PlayStation, you know, way back when. And that really just goes to show you that, like, the sound, like, that is the sound of death in the original Metal Gear Solid. Right. You know, the snake? Snake! Like, oh, yes. we heard that sound so much that it has become a permanent part of our memory. And she didn't even play fucking Metal Gear. And so it really does, I think, illustrate what it's like to have played that version of Metal Gear where it was just constantly die, continue, or restart, or whatever, and this version of Metal Gear where you have to actually work at getting fucking killed. So how, this is interesting because I, you know, you and I did not, we, we try very hard not to talk about what we talk about on the show ahead of time, yeah. so it's fresh and honest as we're, as we're recording the show. We don't want to just be rehashing conversations we had, so we, we don't talk about it. It's also the and reason I, we're not getting that daytime reality TV deal anytime soon. <laughs> right, we're, we're far too unpolished. Right. But um, uh, I didn't realize that you were playing Metal Gear Solid Five that way, mm-hmm. and, and, and so I was going to ask you, as somebody who's put many more hours into the game of, uh, than me, uh, sort of how you feel about it in this game, and but you're playing it in a way that is different than most. Not all, I'm sure. There's a lot of people out there that that want that perfection, but I hope not. But basically, God, your sorry. relationship to the dying mechanic in this game is one in which you're trying to die most of the time, and it's probably frustratingly slow for you. It is, but it, it, that's not okay. Here, here's the thing: there's sort of like two separate, there's sort of two separate issues 
at hand here. Number one is the failure spectrum that Tom Francis is talking about in this article. And I right. actually, as a, well, and we, as a <laughs> game mechanic, I think the failure spectrum in, in Metal Gear Solid Five is brilliant because it does it, it allows for every skill level to play the game and to get and to get through the mission to complete the mission continue the story without without getting tripped up by a game over and restart unless you want that to happen and that is the second that's the second thing is this game's approach to saving uh checkpointing and restarting there is no way that i can see to like pause the game go into a menu and say restart this mission or you know restart at the last checkpoint there's no way to right, manually just to start save. Out, like at the point when you're like oh crap I, I didn't want that to happen screw it and you just go back and hit restart mission and start over instead no option of, to right. do that the only th- yep. the only thing that the only thing that you can really do to back up is to die and then you can either have the selection of restarting the mission or restarting from a checkpoint uh, are you saying you wish that was in there and yes i do i i i, yeah. I do not i do not I agree. care for the way the game does saving I don't like the sort of like it's an automated save system. Uh, it, it'll save when you get within a certain range of like an like an installation that has enemies, or it'll save after you've you know developed something with your R and D team. Like the game just sort of saves it at specific points when whenever it, right. it feels like it uh, it's necessary. And I wish that there were a manual save option. I, I don't particularly care for that. So but let that's me ask a you though, with issue re- from right with regard to the failure the spectrum mechanic. though. So you, it's interesting because I hadn't thought of it as a as a as a, uh, as a tool for separating essentially difficulties no. uh, for the different skill levels. So if you look at it that way, and there are still uh, difficulties you, in the game, just to be clear, I was going to say, does that is it more? Uh, do you think it's more effective than say just choosing your difficulty level and having the guys be more alert and harder to avoid uh, rather than allowing the fail state to uh, sort of account for different skill levels. It's hard for me to answer that because, as we've uh, talked about before, I have a mental health problem when it comes to perfection, and <laughs> uh, I, I guess that I guess that I feel like the, the the failure spectrum sort of allows for it, it allows for either you to play, it allows for different styles of play, and it allows for you to kind of infer different levels of difficulty on you. Like I tend to be like all stealth, no kills is, is, is my general approach to things. Right. And the, right. and, and really like the only time that I've ever violated that is in the middle of this, this one like ridiculous fucking mission that I had to do. And like I was inside of this fucking cave system with no way to get an airdrop and my silenced dart the tranquilizer, dart gun, the suppressor ran out. So I had no more silenced weapon, and so I had to switch to my my rifle, my silenced rifle, if I was going to maintain stealth. Or, you know, like I was going to have to sneak up behind every single guard and, and choke them out, but that's not, that's not always possible. Anyway, um, I got sidetracked. What, what the fuck was I talking about? <laughs> <laughs> the, po- the point, though, is that I love that the failure spectrum is as forgiving as it is, just by itself as a game mechanic, because I, I love that it, it, it kind of allows you to, to stay in the game almost no matter what. Like, almost no matter what, the game doesn't want to let you stop, see a game over screen, and then, you know, re- and continue or whatever. The, the, to me, the failure spectrum, the point of it as a game mechanic is to maintain the forward momentum of gameplay and narrative at almost any cost. And I have to say that I, I do like that. It's not that there are some games when I, I, I kind of feel like, 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 like Donkey Kong, like Donkey Kong does not need a failure, a failure spectrum. You know, Donkey Kong needs to either be you're alive or you're fucking dead. Cause you, well, it's kind of like meat boy, a meat boy. It's designed to, and I, and I agree with what you're saying, Brent. And I think it's brilliant because we talk about pacing all the time yeah. and stopping pacing. What did I do? Uh, I, I, I was playing Mad Max uh, and this is just a conversation about pacing. I was playing Mad Max last night, and I'm doing this. Mi- I'm playing for hours. I'm having tons of fun. And I get to a mission where I have to, you know, rescue someone or whatever. And it's a kid, and I pick up the kid. And suddenly, when I pick up the kid, I can only walk. 
I can no longer run. And I've been running all over the place. And as soon as you pick up the kid, you can just walk. And all of a sudden, I felt like I had been, it was as if in real life I was running top speed and then ran into quicksand and couldn't, and everything just right. stopped. I mean, it's, it's almost it like you were killed. carrying like 60 pounds or something. It killed the pacing of the game for me. Um, and, uh, and so a lot of times, a fail state can do that. But when you talk about something like Super Meat Boy, the fail state is built into the, the, uh, the pacing of the game, well, right? Yes, it takes seconds to reload. trial and error. Like, like the nature of that game right. is trial and error. Well, similar to Donkey Kong. When you die in Donkey Kong, it doesn't take forever to reload. You're playing again within seconds. Yeah. Right, but when you have these AAA games with huge assets and all this stuff, it takes a long time to reload. It hurts the pacing of the game, that sense of forward movement through the game. Well, and also, the thing, the thing with Metal Gear specifically is that because it is a stealth-oriented game, and tension is is really the, the thing that the game builds with you sneaking, you know, through a base and trying not to get seen, and you know, and all that kind of thing. Yeah, um, you completely destroy that tension. When you die, go to a go to a game over state, and then reload. And like in my case, the case of the mentally ill perfectionist, the the choice to like restart the mission might rewind the clock for you like an hour or something like that because you got to take into account like where the helicopter drops you, travel time to to the location. I think it's like episode six. I think episode six. That's the mission I was talking about, like where you're in the cave system. And like that, yeah. the setup for that mission is, I mean, they drop you probably like 25 kilometers away from like where the mission is actually going to take place. You're on the horse. You have to travel along the road. You have to bypass two or maybe three of like those minor guard posts before you even get to the place. The installation itself is huge. There's probably, you know, there's probably like 20 plus guards there in total. You've got a lot of sneaking to do. You've got the recon and all that. And so think about... Like, like, how much sense does it make to, like, stop and restart that? That's the kind of, like, you're telling me the story, and I'm like, I would give up after one time trying to get it perfect, because just having to go through all of that to get to where I was doing it would make me pull my yeah, hair out. Yeah, I mean, how could it be worth it? Unless you're me, in which case I've redid that, I, I restarted that mission five times! Oh my god. Um, and, and bear in mind, three of those times, I was at the fuck, like I was at the end, like I was at the end uh, goal when I restarted. Oh my god! Because dude, I no, messed no. up. Don't be like me, kids. Right. So, so what I'm hearing is Metal Gear Solid is only a game for people with mental health issues. I, I don't, I don't think that's exactly the point I'm making. <laughs> but, I'm just kidding. Uh, I think that if played pro, like if if I were utilizing this more, and maybe I need to reconsider for the sake of my sanity, if if I was utilizing this failure spectrum more. Essentially, what that would mean is that all of that time I'd invested in going through, you know, the, the travel cycle to this mission and like all the stuff you got to do, the, the major sneaking and the recon and all that, none of that gets wasted. I, and, you know, like all of that, it, the game gives you so many opportunities to keep on playing and to not have all of that time and everything go to waste. And the game is asking you to invest time, it's asking you to, to be patient, it's asking you to. You know, go up somewhere in a location where you can see where you're going to be going, break out the scope, tag the enemies, mark some mark some infrastructure that you're going to capture or destroy, that kind of stuff. The game is asking you to invest all that time, and I think that it's very fair of the game to build in a mechanic that virtually ensures that your time will not be wasted because you make one mistake. Unless you're Brent. Unless you're me, in which case the mistake is being me. <laughs> uh, no, I think it's I think it's interesting, Brent. I'm curious to hear from players of Metal Gear Solid if they feel because I again I feel like this is a bit of a deviation from the series previously. So I'm curious to hear what players of the game think of that. But in general, uh, I would like to hear from people what they think about a failure spectrum. I personally uh, think that uh, you know it's it's an interesting concept and keeping that idea of pacing. It's you know I, I've talked about it for years that pacing to me is one of the most important things in a video game, and uh, and I and I think that uh, if if a tiered fail state I, I you know it does i don't know if it has to have you know necessarily as many tiers as i described for metal gear solid 5 but that's certainly you know matched up with the mgs5 gameplay but some sort of tiered fail state that 
that stops the, you from having to watch a 35, 45 second reload screen, I think is a very, very smart idea. So I'd love to hear from listeners about what they think about an MGS5. Other great examples of some of the best fail states or game over mechanics that you guys have seen in modern video games, I think would uh, also be interesting to share. So let us know your thoughts in the comment section. Okay, everybody, let's hit the road, talk a little bit about the games that we're going to be playing this week, and I'll spare you the Metal Gear Solid Five Phantom Pain stories for a couple more minutes while Lauren catches us up on Mad Max. All right, Brent. Uh, so I didn't actually play a ton of games this week. I was out of town over the weekend. I came back, and I thought about 7 o'clock last night, I was like, ah, I'm going to throw Mad Max on for 15, 20 minutes, just, just, just to jump back in there. Seems like a good plan. Four and a half hours later... <laughs> um, I found myself super excited that I finally got the V8 engine. You're, they, they, they got you driving around with the V6 engine for so much of the first part of the game. Uh, and all I wanted was a V8 it's not engine. Cut it. My, my car feels so appropriately badass at this point. Yeah. Um, and, and I, I just imagine continue, it sounds I'm, pretty badass, too. It does. I'm 30 hours in, and it continues to be exactly what it has been for me at this point, which is just fun, uh, satisfying game mechanics. Uh, that put me in some weird Zen gameplay state and like just remarkably beautiful. And I love seeing pictures. I- I'm really curious, Brent, to see how this game goes down uh, in in sort of the lore of my like. If I will play it a year from now, um, it reminds me a little bit of Dying Light uh, in that I was surprised and I loved Dying Light and I just liked the mechanics and the open world. And uh, but I I stopped playing Dying Light because of a save corruption, uh, and I didn't want to have to go back and redo it all. And so, but I did try and pick up Dying Light months after I had finished it, which is not something I do many very often with games. Uh, and so I'm curious to see if I actually pick up Mad Max once I do finish it. Um, a year from now, I, I, I'm curious, but I continue to enjoy it. I, I love seeing everybody's pictures that they're posting. Uh, I, I, it's just, it's a, re- I don't know, it's a really well done game, and I, I'm looking forward to hearing your thoughts on it because I could see you go uh, I, again. I, I could totally understand a person who walks away from the game going, "This shit is repetitive. It's nothing new, and I have no interest in it." Or I could understand someone walking away like me who's i'm just totally enjoying the game you know it, it's interesting because i could actually tell that exact same story about about the phantom pain it's it's very very interesting how certain games i guess because you're really tuned into what whatever it is that the game is doing that even though it might be repetitive you don't mind in the least because the repetition is just an opportunity to keep getting whatever it is you're getting from the game that you enjoy so much. and That's exactly right. Yeah, and in a nutshell, that, that's kind of me with, with the Phantom Pain. I've done... Let's see. I, I, I've actually just... I, I guess I've just completed Episode 7 as far as like the main story missions go. Uh, was it Episode 7? or I, I, I think it's Episode 7. But anyway. Um, and I've done... I think all of the side ops that I've had available right now, which is up to like about 15 now, although th- this mission I just did, like I interrogated a couple of guards and it unlocked like a couple of side missions because like one of them was talking about like a prisoner that's being held somewhere and you know, that kind of stuff. Um, but um, I-, I think I've only got like an overall 6% completion on the game right now. Oh my God. <laughs> just, to, just to put it all in context. Oh my and God. It- it's It's so fascinating how how the game is that's so ridiculous it's interesting how the game has worked so far in that i have visited a a couple of installations there's three in particular i'm thinking of i've visited those installations at least twice for completely different missions uh as an example and you will have played this the the, one of the first things you do in the game is uh you you go after and this is after the prologue uh you go to rescue miller and um and your first stop is a village where there's some intel on exactly where he is. You know the general area, but yep. you know, this is going to nail it down. I remember okay, that. Okay, so that is like the first sort of thing that I did in the game was like go and sneak around that village and find that intel. So I just did a mission. I mean, literally, like I paused the game, came down here to record this with you. I just finished a mission that goes back to that same village, except now. What's going on is there is a meeting of these three commanders from different 
areas in Afghanistan, they're coming to that base to get together to discuss something. And your job is to to take them out. And you can either capture or kill them, but your your job is to uh, is is to take them out at this at this meeting. And my initial thought was, okay, well, so this is going to be like a major sneak mission because they're going to be bringing in like additional people, so there'll be additional guards in the village, and then you know I've got to get into a room with them. There's no doubt going to be guards in the room. How do I take out a room full of five to six people? You know, like that kind of stuff. And as I start the mission, I realize that what the mission is actually saying is they're going to be coming in via these routes and you need to ambush them basically. And so then it becomes like this really interesting, like it's just like a race against time because they're coming from opposite directions. And so you got to like ride out really, really fast in one direction to like ambush that truck, capture the, you know, capture the guy and then race in the opposite direction. You have to kind of skirt the village. So you don't, you know, you don't, alert the guards or anything, but you got to like try to get on the other side of the village where the other commander is coming in. And it was, it was like really interesting because I'm so familiar with that village having spent time there before. It's interesting how that familiarity kind of changes the gameplay experience and the knowledge of like, okay, I generally know that there's not a lot of guards on this side of the village. So I can probably ride through here at full speed and nobody's going to scope me out. And I know that I need to like I need I need to really be cautious about this one area here because there's almost always somebody that's kind of like out near the road here, you know, just like that kind of thing. It's really interesting how that familiarity that you build up with the game kind of pays dividends the more you play. And that's one of the things I do like about open world hmm. games. That 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 one specific quality is something that I find really helps immersion. But anyway, yeah, continuing absolutely. to love the Phantom Pain. <laughs> Uh, hours? Do you know your hour count at this point? Uh, no, I don't. Uh, I have to. I don't know. I'd have to sit down and think about it. I don't think there's a. I don't think there's a way to to actually get that from the PlayStation. Like it doesn't have like a counter like Steam or GOG does. The PlayStation itself does not know. Yeah, I I have no idea where it is right now. I thought now. the game actually did so. I'll go in and see if I can. I'll go in and see if I can find it. I mean, if I was just going to estimate with what I played over the weekend, and bear in mind, a lot of my playtime is dying restart like i was describing but i mean my, my play has got to be above it's got to be above 25 hours at this point i would think awesome just, all right so uh just to guess brent what do you have for the end of the sunset we're breaking away from the playstation 4 both of us <laughs> for our end of the sunset and thank god my end of the sunset goes to a, a youtube video showing off a level created in super mario maker which i think is one of the uh, one of the coolest things that's come along over on the wii u and uh, the, the level that, that you're going to be watching here is called Will You Save Your Son? And this, this video just walks you through this level, and it's hysterical. It's absolutely hysterical. It is a send-up of kind of overly dramatic games designed to elicit emotional responses and, and dive into really dramatic or depressing topics and things like that. It's, it's just a total parody and send-up of all of that stuff but done in Super Mario Maker. It's brilliant. And it's played so straight. Like, you listen to the commentary uh, of, of, the, of the creator walking you through the level and explaining what it is you're experiencing and, 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 and how the game mechanics relate to the choices that you'll make and, and you'll do anything to save your son and, and all of this stuff. Please, spend the three minutes and watch it. It's really, really hysterical. And it, just, it really kind of takes the mick out of... Frankly, a lot of the games that we like to play, a lot of the games that we really play up... But it, uh, it, it's just really, really kind of tipping its hat to that and, uh, and, and reminding us all that, uh, that video games can also just be a lot of fun and not a lot of emotional baggage. But anyway, check it out. It's very, very funny. That's awesome. I did, I did not watch it prior to, uh, and again, you know, we try and keep it fresh, so I didn't watch it prior to uh, going live with the show, and I will watch it as soon as we're done. That sounds awesome. I love stuff like it's that. It's very cool. What do you got? Uh, so I, I got a question for the listeners is what I got, Brent. So what I'm posting is a Tomb Raider gameplay trailer that came out. I think it was today or maybe yesterday. I can't remember, uh, for rise of the Tomb Raider on Xbox one, which is going to release, uh, in November, uh, and then sometime for other platforms in 2032. Um, my question for our audience is this, uh, I, I, I just want to know if this pisses anybody else off. That's really what I want to know. 
I see this trailer, I look at it for the Xbox One, and I think, all I think is bullshit and shenanigans, and I can't think of another example. There's certainly examples of exclusivity, uh, but to, to nothing to this degree. And I was thinking to myself, like, so, so how are they going to not piss everybody off? Like, are they going to release this game? Like, I'm curious, when they release it a year from now for the PlayStation, if they'll include all the DLC uh, to make it sort sort of make it up to PS4 players, yep. uh, and if they do, would they then piss off the Xbox One players by making them pay for it, um, or if they're just assuming that like PS4 players are just going to sort of take it in the ass and not care and pay the full price and have it be a year later? And I, I don't know. I mean, I, I absolutely want to play this game, Brent. And I think it looks great, and I'm sure when the time comes, I won't do this, but. I see this trailer and I like consciously don't want to give them my money for having done this. It's just, and I'm just curious if it, it pisses off everybody, anybody else who's not an Xbox one owner. Obviously if you're an Xbox one owner, you don't care because you're going to get it if you want it. Uh, and I don't blame you for that, but I want to know if it pisses anybody else off. That's, but that's, that's my end of the sunset. Yeah. I, I don't know. I, I wonder about things like this. You know, we've talked before about, you know, platform exclusives and all that. And, Obviously, this is not a platform exclusive. It's a timed exclusive. We know it's going to be coming, you know, to PC later on. It's going to be coming to PS4 later, uh, later beyond that. Still, right? Yeah. But um, I, I don't know. I, I just, I just wonder if, I just wonder if it's worth it. Like, I, I just, I would really, really love to know the dollar value of one of these timed exclusivity deals. I would really, really like to know if it's worth it for any party involved. Does it really benefit Microsoft? To the tune of, you know, thirty-eight million dollars just to just to invent a number. Does it benefit Microsoft thirty-eight million dollars worth to have this timed exclusive? Does it does it benefit Square Enix enough to do that? I mean, you know, like, do they find that they don't really lose any sales at all doing this? That they release the game on one platform and a year later the well, other. I don't, I don't know and, how they would know, Brent. I mean, I, I can't. I don't know any other game that's had a timed exclusivity of a year. Yeah, it, it, it's a pretty, it's a pretty big. I, I don't know that there's a precedent for this, and that's what I have to wonder: is, is Square Enix like, are they really going to make so much money off Microsoft that it will offset? W- will they lose any money from the PS4? Yeah, I, I don't know. It, it's an interesting, uh, it's an interesting question, but uh, I, I've certainly been on on the the receiving end of a couple of these timed exclusivity deals, like you're talking about, and you know, it's never fun if you're the odd man out. So that's a true story. All right, Brent. Speaking so for- of being left out. Uh, yeah, so for our ride along this week, we chose uh, some great, great posts again this week. Thank you guys very much. Uh, we chose a post from Aberjam, uh, a longtime OGR slash EBC listener uh, and friend of the community and podcast host, uh, and a quite the Rocket League uh, gamer in his own right. Uh, Aberjam writes this week In this week's news, Bungie's latest Destiny DLC, The Taken King, reportedly moves content removes content from the vanilla game, such as weekly heroic strikes and nightfall strikes, which are still accessible from within the DLC. General consensus is that this is a move by Bungie Activision to strong-arm people into purchasing the DLC for the game. He links to a related article on Kotaku. He goes on to say, Reading comments here on the site, it would seem that this kind of change is not previously unheard of and is most prevalent in MMOs. The main defense given of this practice is that part of the fluid nature and evolution of these kinds of games... Uh, that prior content will be changed or cut to facilitate the evolution of core gameplay. I personally don't have an issue with this practice if it serves the game on a system-wide level and improves the experience for all of the players. Having played The Taken King, however, I can't think of a bona fide reason for having removed the aforementioned content from non-purchasers of the DLC. Do, and then asked if we have any thoughts on this. Now, uh, Brent, n- neither you nor I are you know, avid players of, of uh, Destiny. No. Um, nor are we avid players of MMOs in general. True. Albeit you did, uh, you were a big fan of the, there was a Star Wars game yeah, I think I, you I mentioned flirted, one time. I flirted with MMOs briefly. Uh, <laughs> yes. With, uh, uh, and by flirted, you mean had a one night stand. I, but, I mean, I um, had like a one year stand. That's right. Um, I, I don't know. Uh, you know, uh, so we're not the most eloquent to speak on this, but I did want to bring it up because I think it's very interesting and potentially um, uh, sig- very significant for players of the game, obviously. Uh, you know, in the article, they, they allude to the fact, Brent, that, uh, you know, on December, on September, excuse me, on October, or was it September? September 14th, there's all this content that you can play as somebody who owns the, what's called the year one or if you're a year one player. And if you don't buy the Taken King or year two expansion pack for 40 bucks, uh, there's all this stuff that you could play on September 14th that you can no longer play on September 15th. Um, and uh, I don't know, man. I, I, I don't know. I mean, games is service. 
it sounds hokey to me. I'm really curious to hear what other listeners who play the game uh, think about this are, because I think there's people to better speak on this subject than you and I, but uh, I, I definitely think it's a, a bit questionable. What do you think, yeah, Brent? The, the, thing, the thing that kind of unnerves me about it is that if, if it were just a straight-up MMO, this is the sort of thing that you would you would kind of expect within reason. I mean, like the, the line is always kind of shifting with MMOs, you know, there's certain things well, like, and I'm speaking specifically about the old Republic and that there is a free tier and then there's a pay tier. And so certain things are behind the pay tier. And I don't like, like there's just sort of an expectation that the game is going to kind of change and evolve over time, but you're going to be continually buying into the game in order to, in order to have access to all that stuff. And with Destiny, given the fact that it is, it's not structured exactly like an MMO with its payment style, but it does have a lot of those kinds of qualities in terms of it, you know, being this online game that is going to evolve and change and grow. I I, th- I think that part of it is just kind of growing pains of you know people sort of saying, well, wait a minute, like I I went to the store and bought this game, and now you're taking stuff away from me, and it's like, well, yeah, that's true, but it's not. It's not exactly like, you know, like like traditional single player game. I mean, it's not, you know, it's not like, you know, fucking Konami coming along and taking shit out of uh, you know, the Phantom Pain because they did all of that before the game even came out. But anyway, it uh in in my mind, it just is kind of emblematic of Destiny trying to be this kind of hybrid style game experience, and this is kind of a this is kind of a consequence of of doing that of uh, you know trying to kind of have a game that you're just going to go buy in a store and it's going to have DLC installments and yet it also kind of has MMO qualities to it as well and some people are you know so, some people are just finding the friction between those two expectations I guess indeed it, it is uh it, it is a thin line to walk that is for sure uh, all right, Brent, with that, I think we're going to call it a yes, show. Indeed. We've had some good conversations this evening, and as usual, we're going to turn it over to the listeners and ask them what they think about what we talked about on any subjects in gaming, including uh, Destiny and the Taken King and how that's leaving players who decided not to upgrade, Tomb Raider 2 gameplay trailer, Super Mario Maker, Mad Max, Metal Gear Solid Five, The Phantom Pain, PlayStation VR, boo to the name, This War of Mine, The Little Ones, or Uncharted, The Nation Drake, The Nathan Drake Collection, which comes out October 9th. We'd like to hear your thoughts on that or all things related to gaming. Let us know what you're thinking. As usual, he is Brent Adams. I am Lauren Baumgarten. And remember, you don't stop playing because you get old. You get old because you stop playing. 